home. It's a miracle of the age being able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody on the other side of the world. But although this needs some very sophisticated electronics connecting the phone together, the telephone itself has remained quite a simple gadget. It's really just a set of push buttons, a couple of switches, um, a bit of electronics inside, a bell or a buzzer of some sort, and of course the handset. Well, uh, I'll take the microphone out and give it to Rex. The microphone and the earpiece are remarkably similar to those on the very first telephone invented over a hundred years ago. If I connect up the earpiece at this end, and uh, Rex connects up the microphone at the other end, I should be able to hear him. Hello, can you hear me, Tim? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> it works very well. <laughs> this is too faint to work over long distances, but the remarkable thing is that there's no battery in this circuit. It's just the microphone at one end and the earpiece at the other. In this programme, I'm going to look at how the telephone evolved from simple devices like this to become the elaborate international system it is today. Hello, Tim. Can you hear me? It had been discovered in 1820 that any wire carrying electricity becomes slightly magnetic. The effect was called electromagnetism. Wrapping round the wire round in a coil greatly increases the effect. The extraordinary thing is that until 25 years ago, most of the telephone system was worked by devices based on this simple effect. The first use of the electromagnet, though, was for the telegraph, which in many ways was the forerunner of the telephone. In its simplest form, you simply had a switch at one end, Rex, and a needle at the other. This was made in lots of different varieties. This is a one for sending private messages. This is a twin needle one, and you could send all the different letters of the alphabet by sort of code of different sequences of needle movements. This is a replica of Samuel Morse's original apparatus. It was quite elaborate at first. You had to turn this handle to send the messages. And the receiver printed the messages out on a strip of paper but the operators soon realised they could simply tap the message out and decipher the signal simply by listening to it. And this was the origin of Morse code. This was a system for unskilled operators. You had one switch for each letter of the alphabet, and if I press the R, turn the handle, the receiving station would have an identical instrument and the needle in the middle would go round to the same letter. This is a more primitive version of the same thing. Well, by 1860, the telegraph system had become big business. All the major towns in Europe and America had a telegraph station. The lines became so busy that uh, they had to develop a way of sending the messages at high speed. So you had somebody printing the, the messages out on paper tape and putting them into one of these machines, the high-speed sender. And at the other end, you had one of these machines, which is a, a, a high inking machine. Not working at very high speed at the moment. OK, that's enough of that. Well, this required a whole army of clerks, which had to punch the messages out and then decipher them at the other end. It was while trying to invent an improved version of this that Alexander Graham Bell realised that it might be possible to spend, send speech down the wires instead of, instead of simple pulses. Bell's father was an ebullient teacher of elocution and speech therapy in Edinburgh. Graham, now listen to this poor woman. She has the most terrible problems with the labials. Oh, and she's got a frightful lisp too. However, Graham's two brothers then died of tuberculosis and his father decided to immigrate to a healthier climate. They had such lovely voices too. We'll do fine in America. Around the ragged... Age 25, Bell himself started teaching speech therapy in Boston. 
At the same time, he came up with his idea of a harmonic telegraph. Recruiting a man from the local ironmonger shop called Watson, he experimented, sending several messages simultaneously at different tones, but nothing would make it work. Oh, it doesn't it work? On June the 2nd, 1875, though, he suddenly realised it could be modified to transmit speech. Bell described what he'd done as transmitting voice-shaped currents. Instead of the electromagnet just being on or off, he was using it to vibrate a diaphragm and produce sounds. Well, if uh, Rex now connects the electromagnet to my record player, and we use the bass drum skin as the diaphragm, um, you should be able to hear something. The magnet's vibrating the skin, and this is moving the air, reproducing the original sound. This is one of Bell's original telephones. You can see exactly the same arrangement with the diaphragm here and the electromagnet. You listen in through the bottom here. This is a, a modern telephone earpiece, and you can see this has a metal diaphragm, and the electromagnet is embedded in plastic down the bottom. The principle is exactly the same. Bell's patents made him a very rich man, and he built an enormous mansion in Nova Scotia. He grew rather portly and started experimenting with kites, twin-bearing sheep, iron lungs, hydrofoils and all things. He became completely fed up with the telephone and wrote, I have become so detached from it, I often wonder if I really did invent it, or was it just someone else I'd read about? Bell used the second receiver as his microphone. It works exactly in reverse. When you speak near it, the diaphragm vibrates and creates a tiny electric current in the electromagnet. I can show you this with a loudspeaker. The loudspeaker is just a larger version of the same thing, really, with a paper cone as a diaphragm and an electromagnet underneath. Uh, I've connected it to a meter here, and uh, when I move the diaphragm, the meter raises the current. Well, now if I connect it to the second speaker, when I vibrate one speaker, the other one vibrates too. This is how Rex was managing to talk to me at the beginning of the program. But uh, it's not a very efficient process, this. This is why Rex's voice was so faint. And without uh, any electronics, Bell's idea was really much too faint to be of any practical use at all. The first practical telephone used a completely different type of microphone. This was patented by Thomas Edison some two years after Bell. Edison realised that if you apply a small amount of pressure to a lump of carbon, its resistance changed, so he fitted a diaphragm to a piece of carbon. This basic idea was greatly improved by Reverend Hunnings. He used a whole pile of carbon granules. And we can reproduce this quite easily using a, a coffee jar top. I've put a couple of bits of silver paper in here to form a contact and connecting up